I think we should get started. I just want to say first, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Drew McCarter, and I'm Pure Earth's Executive Director, and I'll be hosting today's panel. Um, before we get started, a couple of quick points. Please keep your microphones muted, and we encourage you to put any questions you may have in the chat box down below, and we'll be sure to save some time at the end to answer uh, as many questions as we can. This webinar is part of a series of events that Pure Earth is hosting for the 10th Annual International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week. And today we're discussing lead recycling in Africa with three people that have worked extensively on the issue. We will be both looking back at progress made in Senegal since that country experienced a lead poisoning tragedy, but also and importantly looking forward to existing opportunities to further progress across the region. We will begin with uh, the screening of a mini documentary called The Lead Rush. And uh, The Lead Rush follows the story of a community, uh, Churoi Sumer in Senegal, where 18 young children died between 2007 and 2008 as a result of informal lead acid battery recycling. Pure Earth and the Global Alliance for Health and Pollution returned to that community 13 years later after the disaster there to assess the sustainability of environmental health interventions that took place there. After we watch this short film, I will introduce our panel and we'll have plenty of time to hear their extensive experiences and thoughts on how further progress can be made across the region. So let's start with the film. In 2007, a lethal illness began to creep through the community of Troy sur mer Senegal. The local hospitals tried to help. The symptoms were the same as malaria, but they knew it was not malaria or any of the other diseases that impact people living in sub-Saharan Africa. Over the course of six months, 18 children died. It threatened the entire community but they came together to safeguard the future of their children and their home. This is their story. On s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait une activité de recyclage de batteries hein, au plomb et qui avait entraîné ces cas d'intoxication au plomb. Et bien sûr, toute la population était exposée, mais à cause de la vulnérabilité de l'enfant, on s'est plus intéressé à la prise en charge de ces enfants. Chiroy sur mer sits on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, 15 kilometers outside of Dakar. Community members had been informally recycling lead from used lead acid batteries since the 1990s, using the lead for fishing weights. In 2007, everything changed. The price of lead dramatically increased due to worldwide demand. Realizing there was a fortune to be made, foreign traders came to the community offering women and children money for the lead that was left over in the soil. 
At least 50 women took bags of contaminated waste into their homes to extract the remaining lead. They made the same in one hour as someone who worked all day in the market. Donc euh, c'est un système ou bien un commerce très lucratif. Donc c'est pourquoi les femmes s'adonnaient à cela au bout d'une dizaine d'années, d'une quinzaine d'années là où les femmes euh, brûlaient donc euh, les batteries là, on parvenait à avoir des résidus de, de plomb une, en prenant du sable, en filtrant le sable là, en tamisant le sable là, on parvenait à avoir donc des, des, des graines de, de plomb. Donc ça a récolté beaucoup d'argent. Donc on est obligé de faire un site en tant que jeune, il faut du sol, du jaille pour avoir bien de cours, pour avoir bien de sombreté. On ne voyait pas le danger venir. Donc, là, on a dans ces amphales, c'est comme on est dans ces là. Donc, vous pouvez dire que dans ces choses à 100 Mais cette période a coïncidé avec la ruée vers le plomb. Moi, je l'appelle la ruée vers le plomb. Nous, ce qu'on a remarqué pendant cette période c'est que les enfants, la plupart du temps, ils tombaient malades et on ne savait pas la raison. Et quelqu'un qui est malade, donc des fois, il ne peut pas venir à l'école. Parfois, si on a un enfant, on a un enfant, on a un enfant, Et chez les enfants, ce qui est plus euh, euh, dramatique, c'est l'atteinte du cerveau. Mais le, le plomb peut aussi... Bon, l'atteinte du cerveau avec, euh, bien sûr, euh, une diminution du quotient intellectuel qui peut être même irréversible. Sinon, le plomb va aussi attaquer le système hématologique, hein, peut aussi attaquer euh, les organes mous, hein, et puis un stockage aussi au, au niveau des os, etc., qui va en plus aggraver même la symptomatologie parce que même si on arrête l'exposition à cause de ce stockage, les symptomatologies peuvent revenir. No amount of lead in blood is safe. Levels as low as 5 micrograms per deciliter can be detrimental to a child's development. The children tested in Chiroy sur mer had an average of 129 micrograms per deciliter. Every person tested was lead poisoned. Realizing an emergency intervention was needed, the government approached international experts for assistance. The Foundation Black Simic New Senegal. Pure Earth worked with the government to develop a cleanup plan. Euh, on a décontaminé carrément, donc lavé les maisons, décapé le sol. Donc, euh, en collaboration avec le ministère de l'Environnement, euh, on a pu. Euh, Blacksmith, hein, qui était là à l'époque, donc euh, Pure Earth maintenant. Et à l'époque, euh, on était arrivé plus, sur plusieurs mois. Hein, Et nous, on a accompagné avec des plombémies qu'on faisait régulièrement chez ces enfants pour voir euh, l'évolution. Euh, mais à l'époque, quand on arrêtait au niveau de Nganyo, on avait quand même des taux assez acceptables. Après, bien sûr, des contaminations et lavage, nettoyage du quartier. In response to this tragedy, the Senegalese government, for the first time, prohibited the informal dismantling of these batteries. They also began the process of creating a formal lead recycling infrastructure. In 2021, the original agencies that advised the government returned to test the community for lead in partnership with the Ministry of Health's Poison Control Center. 13 years after the tragedy, the lead in the soil is less than 400 parts per million which is the United States Environmental Protection Agency's residential safety standard. Average blood lead levels in the community have decreased significantly. I 
Today, parents in Chiroy sur Mer take comfort knowing that their children born after the cleanup have a healthier future, free from lead poisoning. This is the next generation. All right. It's such an interesting story in Senegal, not only because it's one of the world's most significant lead poisoning tragedies, but it's also a story of progress. Out of that tragedy came a great deal of progress in Senegal to formalize a previously informal industry and dramatically improve the environmental health and safety of the lead recycling sector there. And with that as a backdrop, I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists who can talk about lessons learned from Senegal, from Ghana, from Nigeria, from across the region, um, and share their thoughts about what's needed in the future. So uh, I'd like to start by uh, introducing Dr. Samson Atiemo. Samson is the executive chairman of the Mountain Research Institute in Ghana. His focus on e-waste and battery management issues in Ghana includes years of research and advocacy, both locally and internationally. He's the co-author of an e-waste baseline report on Ghana, which has become the basis for the development of Ghanaian international cooperation projects and Ghana's e-waste technical guidelines. He has supported numerous used battery and e-waste processing companies um, to improve environmental performance. And MRI has also conducted dozens of site assessments of lead contaminated sites all across Ghana in collaboration with Pure Earth. So welcome, Samson. And we're also joined by Tersir Ugbor, the Director and Executive Secretary of the Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling in Nigeria, which is a producer responsibility organization for the battery sector. The organization's mandate includes the end of life management of all used lead acid batteries and lithium batteries under the country's extended producer responsibility program and Tersir is also the founder and CEO of the Redden Recycling Company, involved in several recycling industries, including that of used lead acid batteries. Welcome, Tersir. And then finally, we're joined by Brian Wilson, who spent 18 years working in the smelting industry before becoming a consultant to many organizations that work to improve the environmental health and safety of the industry including the International Lead Association, Pure Earth, UNEP, and many others. Um, Brian's well known by many folks in this space. He spent over two decades helping to advise companies and governments about the health, environmental, and financial benefits of sound used lead acid battery recycling, particularly in countries that have a large informal sector. So thanks for being here, Brian. Samson, I'd like to start by turning to you. Um, I know that you're going to share some details about a really interesting program that took place in Ghana. And I wonder if you would also describe for us the evolution that has taken place in Ghana from a country that had a large informal sector to one that now has a dominant formal recycling sector and what programs and policies you think were successful in that evolution. So Samson, over to you. Thank you um, very much. Um, I'll ask Sarah to put my slide on for me. But um, before I start my, my short presentation, I must say that I must congratulate you for the video. It captures more or less what we have seen in, in Ghana over the years 
And now we have moved into a new era of battery recycling. It could have been worse if the situation had um, persisted. So I do this presentation. Um, Sarah, can you give me um, access to the uh, access control or you can change the slides for me, whichever is easier. Yes. So the problem we have in Ghana has normally been uncontrolled breaking and drainage of batteries. We have former informal crude recycling, just like what was happening in Senegal. And also we have formal recycling, but some of them are substandard. If you look at the picture on, my, on, on the left-hand side of the screen, this is a former battery recycling uh, entity with very low standard. So at a point, we didn't have any tanker requirements, we have no SOPs, and we didn't have the best environmental health and safety um, standards for these batteries. Sarah, next slide, please. Oh, um, what happened? Um, yes. So next slide, please. There was just a tanker hit for me. So next slide, please. So this is this picture actually shows what we had in Ghana, where you have crude collection because the companies are asking the collectors to just um, to just bring empty shells of the batteries. They don't want the acid and all that. To solve this problem, we needed to do something real quick. And to do it real quick, we had, with the support of the Sustainable Recycling Industries Project, this um, was actually financed by the Swiss um, government. We developed what we call the standard operating procedures for batteries. Uh, please, can you? Click the next one because there are two more pictures that are, um, are there. Now, yes, just another click, please. Now, the Sustainable Recycling Industries team is made up of um, the Ministry of Environment, Environmental Protection Agency. We have the Ghana National Cleanup Production Agency and the Mountain Research Institute, where I work together with OCO Institute. But as a team, we couldn't do it all. So we approached the material. Um, stewardship initiative, where we have the International Lead Association, um, of course, with Brian Wilson in the lead, Eurobat, Battery Council, and the Battery Association, uh, Association of Battery Recyclers, all coming together to support us in developing this standard operating procedures. So at this stage, I want to just walk you through the standard uh, operating procedures. It looks like we may have lost Samson. Hopefully he can rejoin us in just a second, but he may have connectivity issues. There he comes back, excellent. Samson, welcome back. You're muted currently. Sorry, um, sometimes you, you can't help me, but... Uh... You have these um, network problems, so sorry. Um, next slide, please. So, what is in the, what is in this SOP? When you pick our SOP, which is published on Sustainable Recycling Industries website, you have um, three main sections: introduction that looks at the general background issues, and then you have general aspect of ULA recycling before you go into the SOP itself. Next slide, please. Now the SOP um, is made up of two main contents. You have section A that deals with general requirements and then section B that deals with the technical um, requirements of the SOPs. So for example, general requirements looks like licensing, plant location, personal hygiene, health and safety issues, et cetera. While the technical requirement actually takes a deep dive into specific aspects of ULAB um, recycling. 
every single step in the recycling value chain is covered within, within this um, SOP. Next slide. So this is a typical SOP that you will find, which was written under the projects. The first thing you will find is the number, the SOP number, the sheet number. So for example, this one indicates A22, A2.2, meaning that it's a general requirement under the SOP. We may have lost Samson's audio again. Hopefully he can rejoin quickly. Samson, you're currently muted. If you're still with us, we'll give you a second to try to rejoin here. Yeah, my apologies for the network. At this stage, I don't know why it keeps um, stopping. But Sarah, you can please just press um, the button for me. Um, so yes, so this is the sheet number. The next one, please is the subject of the title. So you see that this one talks about respirators. Next one, please. The next one will talk about the requirement. So for example, these respirators are needed for specific activities within the um, battery recycling value chain. Next one, please. Then you have what is the scope of this SOP? You see that we put symbols at the top to show collection, bulk transportation, and then um, recycling. Meaning that during collection, during bulk transportation and recycling, these respirators are needed to be used by the operators. Next, 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 please. Then we give a brief background issues to the um the, to the respirators and then we give technical description of what type of respirators are needed for this particular op operation let's my let's be careful that during the um covid covid pandemic there has been a lot of these um, nose masks that are in the system and which are sometimes mis mistakenly described as respirators so here we have technical description of what the respirator should look like Next one, please. Then we show you by way of this SOP by pictures, what is acceptable practice and which practices are, are, are not acceptable. So you see the unacceptable practices are marked in red with a cross and the good practices are marked in green. And lastly, if there are additional information which could not be put into the descriptions or the tanker description, a place is created which we call further notes. And then we put this information there. It is designed in such a way that it is easy to be read by both technical and non-technical people. So this is how the SOP that Ghana developed look like. Now, before I bring my, my presentation to an end, I just want to highlight the importance of this SOP to the industry. First, it helps in effective management of practices within the value chain is good for, it allows us to now begin to identify the need for infrastructure and equipment that are required for the businesses in the sector. The SOP in its full implementation will minimize risk for environment and occupational health. And then the SOP also helps in, environment, uh, in environmental monitoring because it's actually cut loss what kind of monitoring are needed to be done. Next one. Then for the regulators, these SOPs are very, very important because um, sometimes when they go to the field to do auditing of facilities, they tend to use their own discretions. So the discretionary powers of the regulators are a bit reduced because now you have specific activities and specific requirements that are needed to be followed when you are on the field. It promotes 
Um, and and it, it, it's an important tool for promoting and monitoring sound management. There are detailed information that is provided in these SOPs for various sectors. And we think that it will guide environmental and health impact assessment for, for facilities to operate within the framework of the laws of the country. Let me tell you that in Ghana, um, when we wrote this SOP, we realized that there was a lot of international interest. And so we had to adopt specific SOP for Ghana. And in Ghana, we actually put in national laws to the various activities that are required. So this, now and now in Ghana, we call it technical guidelines because we put in a lot of laws that are needed to be followed. My recommendation is that countries can easily adapt this SOP and use it to manage um, these um, facilities that are operating below par. Um, on behalf of the team, let's write, um, uh, Sarah. On behalf of the team, I want to thank Brian Wilson a lot for giving us all the technical support. Also, Andreas Manhart from Oko Institute, who was with us throughout the development of these SOPs. And for those who are interested in getting copies of the SOP, please, it's free online, www.sustainablerecycling.org. You will find the, the full version of the SOP there. Feel free to adapt it to your national needs and let's promote sound recycling of used lead acid battery. Thank you very much, um, Drew, for this opportunity. And my apologies again for the um, internet disconnection at certain points. Thank you. No worries at all, Samson, and thank you so much. It really is such an interesting program. I'm sure we would both encourage everyone to go look up the Sustainable Recycling Industries Program and the standard operating procedures that were developed under that. It's a, a model that could be replicated, as Samson mentioned, in other countries. Um, Tercier, I'd like to turn to you and if if you could describe the Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling's work on environmentally sound recycling in Nigeria and what needs and opportunities you see in Nigeria and across the region. And it, it, there you go. Okay, yeah. Thanks very much, Drew. Um, I am trying to share my screen. Is it shared now? Yes, we can see it, although it is not full screen yet. It's in presenter view. Um, um, minutes, oh my goodness. Okay, yeah. Yes, so, um, so the, the Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling is a, it's a producer responsibility organization in Nigeria. It's one of, it's, it's one of three um, uh, producer responsibility organizations in the country. We have a, an e-waste producer responsibility organization uh, and a, a plastic um, and PRO as it is. Our, our PRO is focused on used battery management, uh, lead acid batteries and lithium acid batteries. When we started the company uh, in 2019, the focus was on lead acid batteries because that was the, um, you know, the bulk of the waste batteries in the country were, were lead acid batteries. Um, but now we've seen a growth into lithium ion batteries, especially in the solar home system um, segment of the, you know, of the market. Um, and so we've tried to expand our scope into managing lithium ion batteries, mostly through upcycling, um, because there's very little um, recycling of um, lithium going on in the country. And then, you know, exports, exports of these batteries are not yet um, fully guaranteed. So in the years that we've been registered, we've identified and registered about 10 um, used battery recyclers in the country. Um, some of them are reasonably standard, um, you know, up to date with technology and uh, are not polluting the environment as the case may be. But a lot of them are still polluting. The, the, the good side to this is that Nigeria is no more a bulk um, exporter of scrap batteries, of used batteries. Now, most of the batteries are recycled locally and converted into lead ingots for recycling. Now, the downside is that many of the companies are not recycling, you know, don't have the right technology to recycle it cleanly, so there's still some 
um, some, you know, uh, pollution going on in the recycling process. So there's a there's an effort now to upgrade the facilities with better technology so that they can be as clean as possible. We've also registered um, about 17 or, or 18 uh, waste battery collectors across the country. Um, companies who are dedicated to, to going around and collecting used batteries and delivering to these recycling facilities. Uh, we also have um, over 40 renewable energy companies registered um, in the, you know, under the PRO. So we have a lot of them registered and then they move their, their lithium ion batteries or their lead acid batteries to us for recycling. So when we bring batteries to us, then we identify the right recyclers um, that can handle these batteries and we transfer the batteries over um, to those recyclers. So there's a lot of work going on right now in the country for, for better processes, for better um, standards in, in waste battery collection across the value chain from the collection to transportation um, and then to delivery to, to recycling facilities. Nigeria has adopted uh, an EPR model for, for used battery management, just like what you can see on the screen. It is championed by NESRA, the National Environmental Standards and Regulatory Enforcement Agency. They've developed this PRO model. It's a, it's a model that I think has been adopted across Europe and a lot of other um, continents in the world. Uh, our model is very simple and straightforward. As a PRO was central to everything that goes on. So we, we engage and interact with NESRA. We help to develop the policies and the guidelines for the sector. And then we help to implement these policies and regulations down the line to the producers, collectors, recyclers, and then of course down to informal collectors and then the consumers themselves. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, we, we have gone quite a bit in, in ensuring that this technology, you know, this process is, is adopted by, by every segment of the, of the country. Now there's always some resistance to change. So companies like telecom companies, like banks, who use the bulk, you know, batteries in bulk and are used to traditionally just disposing these batteries to, to the highest bidder, whoever wants to buy. Now there's a requirement that you have to pass through the PRO, you have to sell only to registered recyclers who are recognized by, by the PRO and by the government. Um, and of course, um, the cost of, of selling these used batteries um, you know, is reduced now because you have to pay fees, disposal fees, recycling fees, on these batteries to the PRO, um, that is where we we make some some revenue that we use to implement uh, the, the the EPR program, as the case may be. But we're doing it. We've registered many of them. Um, the acceptability to the new system is growing. Um, just yesterday, a company um, gave us about thirty thousand uh, pieces of um, lithium-ion batteries for disposal. And we're currently in the process of finding solutions for disposal of this huge amount of um, lithium. Initially, I thought I was going to have to export all these batteries out of the country, but I found a, a, a number of local companies here who are doing some upcycling work um, who want to buy up these batteries and use them in the production of some solar home systems and uh, some other products. We also learned that some metal smelting companies are also interested in these lithium batteries. So they crush, they crush the battery, the, the, the lithium batteries in their, you know, in their smelters. It gets mixed up with other kind of metals that they that they smelt, and they just you know they, they turn it into a you know metal ingot, and they use it for whatever purpose um, they want to use this. I don't know if this is sustainable, if this is safe, but um, at least the batteries, the, you know, the, 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 the the content, the materials are not getting into the landfills and into the dump sites. But we're still doing some studies to see how 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 well this is working and if this is actually um, sustainable. So, you know, Nigeria is trying to look at um, circular economy and we're trying to adopt circular economy in several aspects of our industrial life. Um, so for users of batteries, it's simple across the world um, from collection processes, improving the collection process through, um, through new brand new battery dealers. We're also encouraging them to take back used batteries and deliver these used batteries to registered recyclers. Um, so batteries get collected by these dealers, get collected by registered um, battery collection companies, and then get sent to a battery recycler. Um, the case in Ghana, um, like the Samson mentioned, is similar to the country where recycling companies don't want the acid. They consider the acid as you know, not valuable to them. So this has given incentive to the collectors to break the bat you know, break the batteries at their collection site and just dispose this acid you know, into the environment, into the sewers and all that. Um, so there's absolutely no collection of acids going on. 
That is one aspect of the industry that we're seriously looking at, how we can help to collect this acid and what do we do with this acid when they're collected um, by these collectors and how do we encourage the recyclers themselves to stop or to accept batteries with acids um, and then you know put you know develop their facilities you know where they can properly uh, manage this acid in house but when the acids get disposed of the, the dry batteries get transported to recycling facilities they break the batteries open in their breaker some of them have mechanized battery breaking so it's a complete mechanized process many of them still use manual you know manual breaking processes um that is absolutely not, not not clean enough actually so but they get it done in that way the batteries uh the the, the, the lead gets melted into lead ingots and the leg you know the lead ingots get exported out of the country i'll say 99 percent of the lead ingots smelted gets exported because nigeria does not have a very vibrant and battery manufacturing um, industry most 100 percent of the batteries i'll say 90 something percent of the batteries we use in the country are imported so most of the lead we smelt here gets exported out of the country and then we import batteries so for me we don't consider this uh, a full circular economy situation because if we keep exporting the lead and importing batteries that means there's some kind of um, you know we haven't been able to close the loop properly so we're hoping that uh, in a few years time we can get in battery manufacturers here who can buy the lead locally buy the used batteries locally smelt themselves and then remanufacture the batteries here or set up a battery manufacturing plant here and buy lead from from the local lead smelters here and then manufacture batteries here so that we can keep the lead in the country and we can manufacture the batteries in the country so at that, at that stage then we, we, we would have gotten to um the, the kind of circular economy situation where we what we hope to achieve it's also important to note that nigeria has a lot of lead a lot of lead in the ground so we have a, we have a lot of lead ores we have a lot of lithium um you know lithium ores in the country i just i just got a sample of lithium uh lithium ore in my office recently i sent it to somebody who wants to test it and see if we can start mining lithium for exports out of the country for battery manufacturing and lead so, so it's a huge opportunity because we have the raw material both in primary and secondary form in the country and we hope that we can we can take that to the next level of our drive towards supply economy yeah so um, over the years we've had support from the henry bow foundation they, they funded the first um, studies that was done for used battery recycling in the country um, and then that's that that sparked the, the drive towards improving the lead sector the battery recycling sector the the giz the german Con cooperation agency stepped in and has supported the ministry of environment to design and implement uh the the, the new policy on uh, waste batteries that has just been um introduced and of course the international lead association has been really supportive the oco institute has been very supportive in helping us to to give insight into some of the policies and regulations that we've um, designed and uh, implemented over the last few years so now we have um two 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 policies or two laws in the country um for the battery sector we now have the national policy on waste battery management uh, has just been signed into law so it's a 2022 document and then we have the National Environmental Control and um, Regulate Battery Control Regulations 2022, also set up um, by the by NESRA. So we have two um, two frameworks now available. Um, so we hope that you know with this you know with these new policies and regulations, um, we can get to better enforcement. We can shut down facilities that aren't complying properly to environmental regulations, uh, and then hopefully achieve a cleaner environment for for batteries like in the country. I think um, that's about it. Um, I hope um, I've been able to make um, make sense out of out of what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Absolutely, and you raised so many interesting issues there. You know, one of them was the disposal of acid, which is not an issue that's discussed as often as just lead management is discussed, but is a challenge in countries all across the world, and is an important vehicle, not an important, a terrible vehicle that can spread lead, um, you know, outside of, of proper recycling facilities. You've also led us perfectly, I think, into what Brian will discuss, which is essentially kind of the, the trade of lead and the flow of lead within and between African countries and then between the region and other buyers around the world. So a perfect segue. Um, Brian, with that as a lead-in, uh, I invite you to take the floor and, and discuss not only the trade of lead, but opportunities that you see for improving environmental health and safety. 
Thank you very much, Drew. I'm just going to share my screen and we'll start. I hope you can all see the screen. We can. Okay, I'm going to talk about use of acid battery recycling in Africa and outside Africa. First of all, you need to understand what's going on in Africa. And to do that, we need to send out questionnaires. We need to go to personal contact to find out what's going on. And we need to access government databases for vehicle registrations, the number of batteries in use, and also contact the use the Comtrade database to find out if where batteries are being recycled or if they're being exported across boundaries or out of the region. And the UN Comtrade database can also identify where used batteries are being recycled if they're exported within Africa or outside Africa. So let's have a look. Now, of the 82 countries in Africa, there's only 10 countries that have got licensed environmentally sound smelters. And they are South Africa, Tanzania, uh, Mozambique, R Rwanda, uh, Ethiopia. And I've included uh, the UAE and Jordan because they're, they're within the region. We've got Nigeria, Ghana and Senegal. But what is the trade between the nations in Africa and the and the supply of batteries to these recognized and licensed smelters? Well, unfortunately, it's very little. Namibia, Botswana, Zambia and Mozambique do send batteries to South Africa to fry metals. There's also some limited trade in West Africa. We've got Guinea and Guinea-Bissau, they send batteries to Senegal. We've got Niger sending batteries to Ghana. We've also got Burkina Faso sending batteries to Ghana. And we've got Togo sending batteries to Ghana. But otherwise, there's very, very limited trade in Africa supplying smelters with batteries from across the continent. But where are the batteries going? Well, let's have a look, first of all, at India. Batteries are going to India from Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Congo, even from Senegal, where they've already got a smelter, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Ethiopia, where they've got a brand new smelter, Zambia, Togo, Benin. You can see they're even coming from South Africa, where they've got smelters, Liberia, Sierra Leone, the Ivory Coast. In fact, According to the Comtrade database in 2020, 78,000 tonnes of lead acid batteries were moved from the African continent into India for recycling. But India is not the only country that's taking batteries out of Africa for recycling. Also, we find batteries moving to South Korea. They're going from Ghana, where they've got recycling facilities, and from Ethiopia, and from Togo. And even from Nigeria, where you've just heard they've got excellent recycling facilities, as far away as Libya, Liberia, Somalia, Congo. This is a significant trade in usually acid batteries right across the globe. And raw recently, we also find that there's a trade, a healthy trade, a growing trade in battery plates from, from Africa going into the United Arab Emirates, even from Rwanda. Senegal, Gambia, Tanzania, Uganda. This is a growing trade. And Cameroon, Egypt. And what does this mean for the region? Well, let me tell you what it means for the region. It means that the current use of acid battery means that the governments of countries in Africa with licensed secondary lead plants have not banned the export of used lead acid batteries thereby depriving the industry of valuable feedstock. This means that they are unsure about investing in environmentally sound practices, and it also puts at risk the viability, the financial viability of the industries that are already in the country because they can't get enough feedstock. In addition, what it also means is that there's a loss of GDP for those nations that have got environmentally sound smelters because refined lead is three times the price of lead in a used battery. There's a loss of jobs. Now, I've worked in Africa for many, many years. And one thing that Africa needs above all, above anything else is jobs. And recycling creates more jobs than just packing batteries up and shipping them off across the globe. 
It also means a lot of resources for regional lead acid battery production. There are healthy battery manufacturers in South Africa and Kenya, and yet they have to import lead ingots because they can't get enough lead from their own in, from their own smelting operations because batteries, too many batteries, are leaving the continent. Now, I've had experience here because I've been involved in setting up smelters, smelting operations in Ghana and Senegal and Tanzania. And it's a disincentive to investors in clean, used lead acid battery technology if they can't maintain a steady supply of used lead acid batteries to maintain production and throughput through the plant. It puts, it puts off investors if you can't guarantee a, a supply of used batteries. It ignores the Basel Convention proximity principle, which states quite clearly that hazardous waste should be recycled or disposed of as close to the source of the, of the generation of the waste as possible. And you can't tell me that sending the batteries to India and Korea is actually close proximity. It ignores the free trade zones. There's a very healthy free trade zone between Uganda, Tanzania and Kenya. Kenya's crying out for lead. And yet there's no trade whatsoever between those three countries in used and acid batteries. And although it's not always the case, invariably much of the battery acid is dumped in the wonderful environment of South Africa. And that is illegal because hazardous because the battery electrolyte is dilute sulfuric acid is hazardous waste and it should be disposed of in an environmentally sound manner. So that's what I say about Africa. It needs it needs to, to promote its domestic recycling above all else to promote environmentally sound management. And congratulations to Nigeria. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Brian. Really valuable to see this kind of macro perspective of the trade across the region. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions and I'm going to uh, take a little bit of this time to pose my own question that I dearly want to hear the answers uh, from this panel for. Um, Samson and Tersir, this question is directed to you. What steps do you think that your governments and other governments across the region should take next. You know, you've, you've described for us the progress made to date, and now I wanna look forward to what opportunities kind of are, are the low hanging fruit for governments to take the next step. And then a second question, if you were in charge of international development organizations that invest resources in Africa, what types of programs and policies would you want to see developed in the future? And Samson, why don't we start with you? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. For me, now that we are, we have these SOPs well developed in Ghana, the next steps is to ensure the full implementation of the SOPs. See, Brian's presentation looks at the flow of batteries outside Africa. And one of the main arguments um, in the past has been that we don't have very good recycling systems that are available. Some of the formal recycling systems are just like the informal. That is completely hazardous. But now in Ghana, at least we have some recyclers that are operating at the highest level. And therefore we need to now fully implement the SOPs to ensure that we clean up the system and reduce the incidence of pollution um, that comes with it. If that is done successfully, then the next step is to prohibit the export of batteries so that we can provide fish stock for the local um, industries. If I work within the international system, I will also want to improve the transboundary movement of these batteries across Africa. Because nowadays, if you look at the flow, as Brian, was, Brian mentioned, between Ghana and Burkina Faso, a lot of these flows are happening underground because the transporters don't want to go by the Basel or the Bamako Convention. And so they normally hide these batteries and their food staffs. They use trucks that also transport food to bring the same batteries. But we need some level of transparency between Ghana and Niger, between Ghana and Mali, Ghana and Burkina Faso, and other countries that are moving these batteries um, into the recycling plants in Ghana, that it should not go underground again, but we should invest a lot of energy to be more transparent 
about the flow of batteries from neighboring countries into our um, into our recycling systems. These are the first steps I want to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. And, and Tersir, do you have additions to that that you'd like to see from government and or from development agencies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just similar to the, you know, to the Ghana experience, um, if, a few years ago, um, Nigeria kind of put a, a cap on the, on the uh, uh, permits for battery exports out of the country. And so there was a cap of um, 500 tons per company. So you can apply for more than 500 tons of, of, of batteries for exports out of the country under the Basel um, you know, protocol. It was just our own way of limiting the amount of batteries that left the country. But this policy didn't really work because you know, you know, a lot of smuggling, a lot of things were still going on in this sector. But that ban um, created you know, the influx of the inflow of, of battery smelters into the country, most of them from India, um, from the Chinese, from, 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 from Lebanese, you know, Lebanon and all that. So they came here and established these facilities. And now there's a, there's a rush for batteries in the country. Like you, you cannot find a single lead acid batteries anywhere in the country right now because there's a huge, huge demand for this. Many of the, the smelters in the country don't even operate at full capacity because they can't get enough, enough batteries for their feedstock, you know. Now that is one aspect of it. So we need to control and regulate the export of, of batteries. And then if we have if we have too many facilities in the country, it seems like we have excess capacity for recycling right now. Um, many of the facilities are not operating at full capacity. So we need to open up the markets. Nigeria placed a ban on uh, imports of, of used batteries to the country. So you cannot import used batteries to Nigeria. Now, I, I've been advocating that Nigeria opens up its market so that neighboring countries can bring in used batteries into the country. There's some smuggling going on um, of used batteries from neighboring countries, but it is, it is smuggling, so it is not well regulated and it is not enough. If the, if the market was opened up, um, we do a proper um, analysis of the capacity we have locally and allow um, used batteries to come in to, to, to feed our, you know, our local smelters to help. Now, that is on one side of it. On the other side, all the lead being smelted leaves the country. So it's either the, the, the lead is going out as scrap lead of, of used batteries, or it's going out as lead in box. Um, it is difficult to, to, to even tell the quantity of lead in guts leaving the country. So right now, there is no database where you can, you can click a button and say, Nigeria exports 100 tons of lead every year. So if we don't know the volume of lead that we export, or we smelt locally because the smelters are not properly regulated. They don't declare their volumes properly. So you can't even tell the volume of lead we're producing locally. So this makes it difficult for investors who want to come and set up battery manufacturing plants here to do a proper analysis of the volume of lead available and where and where they can buy lead to feed for their battery manufacturing activity. So I think for, for development organizations, there's a lot of support that we need in research, in, uh, in studies to, to, to plug the gaps in terms of data management, data availability in the sector. The government also needs to do a lot in terms of even, I, th I think there needs to be some regulation, even the export of lead out of the country. We need to encourage our lead to stay in-house in and encourage battery manufacturers to come in and invest here. Government needs to give incentives and, and low interest loans or grants. This also, you know, development can also come in and support in this aspect to pro provide funding for battery manufacturing. I've been um, on a, you know, on a, on a tour for a few years now looking for investments to build a battery manufacturing plant in the country. It's been very difficult to find investors. I hope that um, someday some uh, development partner will, you know, we, you know, we see the effort we're making and pump, you know, provide some funding for sort of a middle, you know, a mid scale or a large scale battery manufacturing plants here to feed our our huge demand for batteries in Nigeria, and um, both for renewable energy and for automotive sectors. If we can plug in this loophole from the government side and development sector side, I think uh, we would have gone a long way to achieve good results for for our continent. Really interesting that you have. Uh, uh, facilities operating under capacity while batteries are flowing out of the country to halfway around the world. Um, we have a question in the in the chat here, and we probably have enough time for perhaps one of you to try to answer it. I'll read it out loud here. A uh, question for Dr. Atiemo and Mr. Ugbor. 
where does the transportation of ULABs fit into your circular models in Ghana and Nigeria? Do you have influence over responsible packaging, securing and transporting of the ULAB so they do not spill or otherwise contaminate the roadways, railways, waterways they travel over? Okay, maybe okay. I'll just be snappy with this and Asia can add um, a bit to it. Currently, um, the battery recyclers claim that they have no control over the transportation of these batteries because they don't do direct collection of the batteries from wherever they are coming from into their facility. It's mainly in the hands of the informal sector and collection agents. Even batteries that are moving from other countries into Ghana, the recyclers claim is that they are not doing the direct collection. So there is, for instance, an agent in Togo or uh, Burkina Faso or Mali who is doing the collection and transporting it into their facility. And therefore the obligation for responsible packaging, avoidance of spillage does not rest with them. What we do know as we have, we have mentioned is that these um, collection agents don't also bring the wet batteries. They have to drain all the acid before bringing it. And this is where the standard operating procedure try to address that whether the battery is collected by the companies or collection agents, the packaging during transport must be respected according to the SOP. So this is where we are now. And this is why we are looking for full implementation of the SOP to address some of these issues. Maybe Tessia will add a little bit from Nigeria perspective. Okay, um, well, what, what we have done in Nigeria, what we're trying to do, we, we try to license um, um, trucks that are specialized in um, battery transportation. So we identify trucks, um, companies who want to be involved, who, who are involved in, who have a fleet of trucks. We, we, we lease some of their trucks. We license them to transport used batteries strictly. We're trying to brand these trucks and label them as hazardous material transport. And then we, we attach this transport, these transporters to the used battery collectors. So when you have a batch of batteries for transportation, you're required to, 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 to partner with a, a used battery transporter, um, you know, who then helps to transport your batteries from where you're collecting to where you need to deliver them to um, across the country. Um, so through this effort, we, you know, we've been talking to several regional governments. We've also spoken to um, tax forces. We have a tax force in the country that regulates the movement of trucks around the country. And so if you're a truck driver, um, and you're, calling, you, you, you're transporting batteries, then you have to have um, a kind of a license to transport used batteries. And so this helps us to kind of um, restrict battery transportation to only um, trucks that are licensed to transport um, trucks. This hasn't gone too well because we don't have a lot of trucks who are willing to dedicate their trucks strictly to, to battery transportation. So we're also looking for funding to buy specialized trucks and put across the, you know, put on the roads and then make this available um, for battery transportation. Now we, we're thinking that if we had five to 10 um, large trucks on the road dedicated for this purpose, we know all the collectors, we know where the batteries, you know, the major sources of battery transport across the country. So if we have a few trucks on the road branded and dedicated for battery transportation, and then we can enforce it through the tax forces who regulate but and transport um, you know, truck movements in the country, then we may be able to have some kind of checks on who is transporting batteries and then we can train them on how they can package these used batteries for transportation and from one location to the other. But it's still a work in progress, actually. Thank you both for that. And with that, we're at the end of the hour and I would just want to express my most sincere thanks to our speakers and to everyone who joined us. If you have any remaining questions, please feel free to send them to info at pureearth.org. And please be sure to check out the Mountain Research Institute in Ghana and also the Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling in Nigeria. Finally, Pure Earth is hosting one final webinar called Solving a Toxic Mystery, in which we'll discuss progress to address adulterated spices, lead adulterated spices. Um, that takes place on November 1st at 12 noon Eastern time. And you can register at pureearth.org. And with that, I'll just say thank you all and have a great day.